Good evening and welcome to our teenage Bible class. Appreciate you joining us here this evening. I apologize for the last minute change of having to uh, rearrange the way we usually do this. I know usually we do this class on Zoom, uh, but because of a scheduling conflict that came up, uh, I was unable to do the live, so we're going to do this uh, pre-recorded. Uh, I hope that you're able to watch this, and like I say, if you have any, as always, if you have any questions, please uh, contact us or just write us, let us know. Uh, we will probably get with you this week about some things we may have going on, uh, but hopefully we'll get that. And like I say, if you uh, see this video, I hope you watch it, uh, and that way you'll be ready for next week. Next week, we'll continue back and be back to our live class. Uh, you know, we've been studying the book of Mark. We've been looking at Mark as he has written to a Gentile world, and he's written to the Roman world. Tell them about Jesus. And so as we look at that, uh, we continue that study tonight to uh, look at what Mark is saying to them and what Mark is, is telling us about Jesus. And we get some very interesting interactions tonight. We're going to talk about Jesus' view of marriage. Now we're going to talk about Jesus' view of children. And then finally we're going to see uh, the dedication to Jesus that is required to be a follower of his. And so uh, that's what we're going to look at as we go through these uh, this, this verses we got. We're only going to go through about verse 31 uh, tonight. Uh, we are going to uh, cover about half this book, uh, and then we are going to that be all for run do for now. Uh, so let's uh, let's let's start in verse one of Matthew of Mark chapter ten. All right, verse one, and he left there and went to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan, and crowds gathered to him again. And again, as he was on, as was his custom, he taught them. And the Pharisees came to came up in order to test him and asked, "Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife?" And he answered them, "What did Moses command you?" And they said, "Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away." And Jesus said to them, "Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you that this commandment." But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Uh, excuse me, I went too far there. Um, and in verse ten, excuse me, I, I thought I was supposed to go further. Uh, and in his and in the house and in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, "Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery." So let's talk about this, what Jesus is doing. Now, again, you get the, the, the setting of where Jesus is. Uh, Jesus has left where he was at before in chapter 9. Now he's traveling to the region of Judea uh, beyond the Jordan. He, he's on, the, on this side of Jordan. He is in Judea. He's out of Galilee. He's not in Samaria. He's in Judea, which is down around Jerusalem. Uh, this is his last little trip. Uh, and what he is, where he's at, uh, he is at or in the area that is under the reign of Herod Antipas. Uh, now, this is the Herod. You may not know Herod Antipas. You don't see that word in the Bible or that name mentioned. But this is the Herod who put John the Baptist to death. Remember, a few chapters ago, we read about John the Baptist being beheaded. And he was beheaded because he taught and preached against Herod Antipas because Herod had married his niece, uh, his brother Philip's wife, Herodias. Uh, and so he was put to death for that very reason, for pro, for. A, for saying that Herod Antipas was wrong for marrying his niece, his niece uh, and his sister-in-law uh, uh, before she was divorced to her husband, before divorced to his brother. And, and again, uh, history never records that they were ever properly divorced uh, before he married them. And, and remember, John preached very heavily against that. And Herod Antipas refused to put John to death because he was afraid of the people until his wife tricked him into uh, granting the request of the young girl who danced, who was his wife's daughter. Uh, and again, and that, that's a story we've talked about before. But this is where Jesus is. And, and so I think what's happening is the Pharisees are coming up to him and asking him this question because they want to test him. They're going to try Jesus. And that's what they, they say here. They're coming to try Jesus to get him to fall, to mess up, to offend people. Uh, they may be wanting to, one, have him offend Herod, where Herod is going to take the same action with Jesus they did with they did with John the Baptist, and that was putting him to death. Uh, the other flip side of this coin may be uh, that they are trying to divide the people, and, and the, the people were divided in Jesus' time about what 
what constituted uh, divorce, what constituted a man being able to divorce and remarry. And again, it's not necessarily divorce, it's his remarrying part. Uh, there were two thoughts of school. One, a conservative idea um, that was uh, uh, done by Rab- uh, Rabbi Shema, uh, and he had a teaching that the only reason you could, a man could divorce his wife and remarry another woman uh, was for uh uh, adultery. Uh, he one spouse cheated on the other. Uh, that was the only grounds for divorce. Uh, the other, the liberal side, was a, a man by the name of Hillel who said that a man could divorce his wife for any reason, any uh, any any reason at all. He could divorce his wife and put her away and marry another one. There's other people who taught these very similar things. Uh, there was another one, uh, I believe it's Rabbi Akima, uh, who taught that. Uh, if a man found a wife, uh, another woman, excuse me, who was more pleasant, more fair in his eyes than his wife, then he could divorce his current wife and marry the other woman with no problem. Uh, and so the the Jews were torn about this. They were wondering about well, what was what, what what about marriage, divorce, remarriage? What was the idea? And it's still a question we have today. A lot of people have problems with this, and a lot of things, uh, a lot of people don't want to listen to what Jesus says about it. But it's very important to look at what Jesus said and see his foundation. And so they ask him, and they ask. The question is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife again this is to set him up uh, because depending on how he answers he could offend certain people and not only that uh, this is their way of trying to put him against moses because they're going to talk about in just a minute moses are giving a law about this and they're going to ask jesus interpretation of that law uh and so you notice verse three jesus answered them what did moses command you so jesus instead of going into the trap and, and falling in and having trouble he sort of flips this around on them and says okay well what did moses say what does Moses say about this, 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 this topic? And notice they answer, verse 4, Moses allowed a man to re- write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. Now, what happens is that Moses, uh, by God's command, uh, added another step into the divorce process. Before Moses gave this law, uh, the man, if man wanted to divorce his wife, he could just tell his wife to leave and get out, and, and he didn't have anything to do with it anymore. But Moses put in this step of having to get a certificate, and a certificate was a letter that was say, this at this point, a so-and-so uh, has a divorced from so-and-so, the, the husband is divorced from the wife, and she's now free to marry another woman, uh, another man. And the idea was was that that would happen so that um, uh, the man would have to really consider and think about what he was going to do, what he was doing. It wasn't something simple as he got mad one day and just told his wife to leave. Now, he would have to go through a process to divorce her, and, and hopefully in the time of going through that process, uh, he would change his mind. And so they say, well, well, Moses said, just give her a certificate of divorce. Moses said, give her a letter. And what happens is at this time, there were scribes and there were priests who were skilled at writing these letters. They were people you'd have to go and pay money money for them to write you this certificate of divorce for it to be official. Uh, and so they, they talk about this idea of what they're doing. Uh, now, Jesus goes on in verse 5 to give them the true answer. Uh, Jesus said to them, because of the hardness, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. Because of your hardness, because of your refusal to listen to God, because of your refusal to do what God told you to do. That's why Moses gave you this command. And so what Jesus is saying is he says that, yes, this is what Moses said, but this is not God's intention. This was not God's plan from the beginning. Verse 8, Jesus says, from the beginning of God's creation, God had a purpose. Notice he goes back and he quotes Genesis 2 for us where he says that God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. He tells here the plan of marriage. Uh, and this is a, a plan that, that, that we need to pay attention to. Uh, and, and I think that, that, that we need to look because there's a lot of people in our world today who don't hold this plan anymore. Uh, but this is still God's plan. Uh, if you want a healthy marriage, and, and y'all are all getting to that age as, as teenagers, getting ready to go into the world of dating and into the world of looking for a future spouse, one thing that you want to do is you want to find someone who's committed, someone who believes this right here, what Jesus says. Because uh, if they don't believe this, then they're not. Uh, they, that doesn't mean they're going to stay true and going to be faithful. But Jesus says for this reason, uh, th- from the beginning, this was God's plan. And God's plan is to leave, cleave, and weave. Uh, th- those are three rhyming words of this idea. Number one, he's going to leave a father and mother. This applies to the girl just as much as a boy. That they're going to leave. They're going to leave their old family. They're going to be separated from that family. That's the word cleave. They'll leave his father and mother and hold fast his wife. They're creating a new lifestyle. They're creating a new, a new family. And in doing that, they have to depart from their old one. 
Uh, and this is a major thing that a lot of people miss today is they don't uh, leave their, their parents. Uh, when they get in a fight, they want to run back to mom and daddy. And mom and daddy take back my, their daughter, their, their little baby girl, their little baby boy. Uh, that doesn't need to be so. Uh, when we marry, we need to separate from our family. That doesn't mean you don't have anything to do with them, but that means that if you've got a problem, you work it out among yourselves. You don't run back and try to get away. And then he says, lastly, you cleave or, or leave, cleave, and weave. You weave back together. You're joined back together. You're joined together. The two shall become one flesh. And that's the idea that they'll become a new person. They'll become a new body, a new family. And uh, spiritually and in physically, they'll become a new person when they have children. That's the idea of the purpose of a marriage. Uh, and then you notice Jesus says so they're no longer two, but one. Uh, he says there's no longer two different people, but they're one. And this is a sacred thing God has laid out. And then verse 9 says, What therefore God has joined together, let not men separate. God has joined these, these two together to be one, to be weaved, to, woven together, to be a united unit and with the plan that they will be faithful, they will be true to each other, and their marriage will last. And God says that this is what God's plan from the beginning was. And he says, let's not let man separate what God has put together. That that's more important, that what God chose, what God did is more important. And this is very important for us to think about today, is when you realize that marriage is not some little trifle thing uh, that we go in half-heartedly and, and without real serious thought. Marriage is serious. Marriage is intended to last. And Jesus goes on from there to talk to his disciples about this because he speaks this to the public. And then verse 10, in the house, when they get away from the crowd, uh, the, pos the disciples ask him again, say, well, Jesus, what did you mean by this? Uh, what do you mean that, that Moses said, give us to your divorce, but God wants us to be together? And he goes a bit further, uh, and Jesus lays out this next commandment of this, that whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. You see, Jesus lays out the idea that uh, if we divorce, if we break up a marriage for any reason other than marital unfaithfulness, he says we commit adultery. Uh, we commit a sin, a sin that we have to do something about to solve. We have to do something about to, to fix. Uh, it's the idea. It, it was explained to me this way. Uh, it's about like I go to your house and I steal your parents' car. I steal that car tonight. I drive it around for the next few days. Uh, but on Sunday, I, I come up to your parents. Uh, I've got the car parked out here at church. I come up to your parents. I give them the key, and I say, I'm so sorry I stole your car. Uh, I'm so sorry I took that car that, that car from you. Do you forgive me? And they say, yeah, we'll forgive you for it. It's it just first time. I say, okay. And then I take that key, and I go back in that car, and I get in that car, and I leave. Did I really repent? Did I give up what I did wrong? No, because I've still got the car. I've still done wrong. I've stolen that car, and I've stayed with that car. I've kept that car. Uh, to make it right, I have to admit I've done wrong and then give that car up. Uh, and that's where this marriage calls. This is what Jesus says, that, that unless you, um, unless, uh, you get, oh, excuse me, uh, once you commit this adultery, uh, to ever be in another relationship like that is to commit adultery. And, and that adultery is committed as long as you're in that relationship, as long as you're with that person. And therefore, uh, we have to be careful. And this is why it's very careful, especially at your age, uh, to think about people who are or who you're dating, who you're talking to, who you're being with, uh, to uh, give the prospects of marriage. Again, for some of you, this is years down the road. And most of you, I think it's going to be years, uh, some further than others. Uh, but think about the, your marriage. Think about when you get married that it's serious. It's not a, a happenstance thing. It's something you're going to take seriously. You're going to take with full heart. And you're going to do it, uh, marry someone who is going to have the same view of marriage that you do. Now, we continue from here into verse 13. In verse 13 through 15, uh, we see the, or 16, we see the next encounter with Jesus in Mark 10. It says, And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to, su to, for to such belong the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. Now, what this was, was this is a typical custom. 
Near the time of Jesus, uh, parents would bring their children to rabbis and great teachers when they were in town. And they would ask them, especially on their birthdays, to lay hands on them, to bless them. Again, not to lay hands to give spiritual powers necessarily, but to bless them and to pray over them, to pray for their protection. And this is what the people do for Jesus. They're wanting to bring their children to Jesus, and he brings them so that he might touch them, so he might bless them. And the disciples stop and say, no, 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 Jesus is too busy for this. Jesus has got too much going on. He's t- teaching and doing all these miracles he doesn't have time for the kids and jesus overhears this and jesus says no he sees them stopping these kids and he says whoa whoa whoa, god whoa stop bring them to me and he does this to teach him a lesson notice he was indignant he was angry he was upset that his apostles stopped these children from coming to him and part of that's because they failed to realize the importance of the children they failed to realize how important these they were to him and he knows he continues to say let them come to me don't hinder them uh, for to such belong the kingdom of god uh, now he's not saying that children are the kingdom that children are christians uh, but he says to such Those who are like children. He says that Christians, as Christians, as God's people, we have to be people who like and act like children. And the idea of acting like children is not to be uh, selfish or not to be centered on self, but to be willing to uh, love, to trust, uh, to care for people. You know, a little child will, will go to just about anybody. Uh, a little child uh, will go and, and give just about anybody a hug or a kiss or, or say hi. And that's the idea of what Jesus wants, that, that pure spirit. And he tells his disciples, no, don't give the children away. Don't push them away. The children are important. He says, for you have to be like them. Again, verse 15, truly I say to you, uh, truly, this is something listen to. I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. He says, don't push the children away, but be like them. Learn a lesson from them. This is a very important and very interesting thing that Jesus says that not only should we be an example for the children, but the children are an example for us. And he notice he takes them in his arms and he blesses them. He prays over them and he puts his hands on them. And, and again, we, we don't know exactly what he does, but we assume with Jesus there's something special connected to this. But Jesus makes time for the little children because they're so precious to him. And, and in Matthew and Luke's account, we see that in this children, it's not just uh, children that are older or maybe four, five, three, that age, but even infants, even infants in their mother's arms that he would hold the little babies and he would pray over them and touch them. Uh, and, and so this is a very important important thing that Jesus would get his apostles aside to see that everyone is valuable. Everyone is important. Everyone is key. And so here we see in chapter 10, we see Jesus 1, 1 lays out the importance of mother and father and how that marriage relationship ought to be together and ought to be strong and ought to be uh, withstand no matter what happens. He also talks about the children, how blessed they are and how they are a blessing to their parents and how they're a blessing to the kingdom and how the, the, the Christians need to be like them. And then we get into the last one we're going to talk about last discussion tonight. And that is talking about the, the young man, the rich young man. Uh, we find out from all three accounts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, that this is, Mark's going to tell us this is a, a, a man uh, who comes to Jesus and he's very rich, or he's rich. Uh, Luke's going to tell us that he's a ruler and that he's extremely rich. Matthew's going to tell us he's very young, that he's a young ruler. Uh, and so what we find out is this one is typically called the rich young ruler. Uh, we have this rich young ruler who comes to Jesus, and this rich young ruler was a guy who comes to Jesus who is a ruler probably of a synagogue. He's over a, a Jewish community, uh, very influential, very high uh, power, very highly respected, and he comes to Jesus with a very important question. He comes to Jesus with a question of, uh, that only Jesus can answer and what he wants to do, what's the man needs to do. Notice verse 17. And as he was sitting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Do you know the commandments? Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give it to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. 
Now, let's talk about this, this encounter. Then we'll talk about the, the effects of after the next few verses. Uh, this man, Jesus, again, ready to leave. He's, he's departing from where he, the region he's at. And this man comes and falls down before him. The, this man of importance comes and bows down before Jesus. And he asks him, good teacher. Now, the idea there, good, is, is he's asking good as Jesus is perfect. Uh, the, the great teacher. Uh, he's putting this good in a very high place. Well, he says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, what this guy is after is he wants to know what he has to do. What more action do I have to do to get into heaven? Uh, and this is a good question, a good, very important question, because this question is asked other places, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Uh, but the, the, the mindset of this man is not right. Uh, in that this man is asking Jesus, what must I do? What act shall I do? What act am I missing uh, to become a, a, a faithful follower, a faithful man of God, to be uh, blessed into this kingdom? And so Jesus is going to question this man's idea of what he thinks it means to be a, a follower of God. Again, he's under the law. And so Jesus asks asking, why do you call me good? Why do you call me good? Uh, and this is good, as perfect, as, as complete, uh, as being sinless. And he says, no one is good except God, uh, God alone. And what Jesus is doing, he's questioning this man's view of himself, not of the man's view of Jesus, but of himself. Because this man, if you ask him, will say he's a good man. He said he, he, he believes he's a good man. He believes he's right. He believes he's done all he can do. But Jesus is going to show him there's one thing lacking. And so Jesus begins to ask him, he says, you know the commandments? And notice these commandments. Do not murder, commit adultery, steal, bear false witness, do not defraud, or the, the, the fraud goes under coveting, I believe, uh, and honor your father and mother. Uh, all of these, these, these questions are summed up in one verse. Now, there, this is six commandments, six of the ten commandments. The first four commandments that Jesus talks about, uh, or that Jesus doesn't talk about, are the ones that are talking about uh, loving God, following God. These commandments are all about loving your brother. And what we're going to see the problem with this man is, is not that he did these things against his brother, but he didn't have love for his brother. Because you listen, he said, just says, do not murder. Uh, don't love someone enough to take their, that, that, that you're going to take someone's life. You're going to kill them. Or you're going to steal their wife or, or, or uh, their, not steal their wife. Uh, do not steal. Do not love them enough to not take from them. Take away what they have. Love them enough not to bear false witness against them. Not to lie about them. To get them in trouble. To cost them their life or their well-being. Uh, don't defraud them. Uh, don't uh don't try to take things from them. Don't covet uh, is the commandment that just by referencing here uh, is the idea of coveting something means that you somebody has something that you want so badly, you'll do whatever it takes to get that thing. And Jesus says, don't do that. And then finally, honor your father and mother. Love your father and mother enough to listen to them, to obey them, to, to serve them. And you notice this guy answers, says, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth, I've done all these things. I've not killed anybody. I've not stolen. I've not bared fault with this. I've not committed adultery. I've done what I need to do. And Jesus looks at him, and, and this is very interesting. Jesus looks at him and loves him. This is a very interesting story. Because this does something that, that people today don't think you can do. And that is that Jesus looks at this man, he loves him, and he's willing to tell him what's wrong. You know, some people today think that, that, that you can't love someone and tell them what they're doing wrong. Uh, and a lot of people who do evil do wrong. They think that. that oh, well, if you, you, you condemn me, then you don't love me. You don't care for me. No. I'm telling you where you messed up. I'm telling you where your sin is because I love you. And that's what Jesus is going to do here. Jesus loves him. He has compassion when, when one of the gospel accounts says about this man. And he says, you lack one thing. You lack something. There's something you're missing. You want to get to heaven? Here's what you've got to do. He says, go sell all that you have and give to the poor. And you'll have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Jesus says, go. Give up your possessions. Give them to the poor. Show the poor that you love them. Show your fellow man that you love them. Remember, this is the other part of that commandment, or the other great commandment of Jesus is to love your neighbor as yourself, or the commandment of the law. Uh, those six commandments that Jesus asked him to be kept, they summed up in love your neighbor as yourself. You see, this guy was doing the parts of the law of don't, of don't do this to your neighbor, uh, but he wasn't doing the things he ought to do for his neighbor because, you see, he had a mis, uh, misconceived or idea of, of, of religion. Uh, something that a lot of people have today, and that is he thought that religion was made up of acts. 
uh, made up of things he does. That if he does these certain things, he doesn't murder, he doesn't steal, he doesn't kill, or doesn't commit adultery, doesn't do all these things, then he's living the perfect life. And Jesus says, no, it's more than that. It's more than going through the rituals, more than going through the acts. It's about the heart, the heart. And Jesus says, give up your possessions. Don't let your possessions possess you. We've talked about this on Sunday morning, talking about Ecclesiastes, and talking about wealth and possessions of, of your purposeful life. The problem with this man is that his life was wrapped up in what he had. And Jesus says, give that up. Give that up and sell it to the poor. Give those things to the poor. Show your neighbor you love him and that you're willing to give up your things and, 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 and take this mighty step and then sell what you have, then come and follow me. He knows verse 22, disheartened by this. This, this man, one, one, one of the gospel accounts, so this, his countenance fell, his face fell. Uh, this man was extremely sad, extremely upset, uh, and he went away sorrowful. He went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. He comes to Jesus and asks the right question. He asks Jesus, what do I got to do to inherit eternal life? What have I got to do to be saved? What have I got to do uh, to make my life right and to be the, 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 the man God wants me to be? And Jesus says, you're doing good with... What you're doing, there's one thing you're lacking, and that is to love your neighbor. Love your neighbor enough to give up what you have. Give up the, the many things you have to help your neighbor in need. And the man says, I can't do that. I can't do that. Why? Because he valued riches. He valued possessions more than following God. And in this leads, the last few verses we're going to talk about tonight, this leads to a discussion among Jesus and his apostles. Verse 23, And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses, brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. You see, Jesus looks at his disciples and he, he sees their reaction and what he's just done and, and the disciples' face are, are downtrodden too. They're, they're, they're wondering what's going to happen. They're afraid of, of what this means for them. And Jesus makes a statement in 23 and 24. He repeats his statement about how difficult it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven, to enter the kingdom of enter the church. How hard it is. Well, why? Because if you're not careful, that wealth will prevent you from obeying God. That wealth will prevent you from giving it up and, and worrying, not about, uh, worrying not about self but about others and do what God has called you to do. And so Jesus tells them, uh, this is hard for the wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. And, and the disciples have a problem with it because uh, in the old world, in the ancient world, they had this philosophy, and, and people today have this philosophy. And that was that if you were rich, if you had money, you had wealth, you had possessions like Abraham and Job did, uh, and this is what they may have built part from, was that if you were blessed like that, then, you were, then God was blessing you, therefore you were doing right. If you were a rich man and you were uh, had wealth, wealth, and you had a, a family, you had all these things, and you were blessed by God. You were doing what God wanted you to do. If you were poor, you were suffering, you didn't have a lot, then God wasn't blessing you. You must have been doing evil. And that's the story of Job. Now, Job shows that that's not the case at all, uh, that possessions are just a uh, part of earthly life. It's not the determination of your faithfulness. Enough. And so the disciples are here thinking, okay, uh, if this rich man, this man who had, had all kind of riches and was a ruler of a synagogue, if he's not worthy in the kingdom of God, then what about this poor fisherman? What about this poor tax collector? What about these men who've left their livelihood and followed Jesus? What about us? And Jesus says, it's hard to enter the kingdom of God. It's hard for the wealth, it's hard for those, let those possessions, the things of life, God, keep them from it. Notice, he says, easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And this is not a, some certain gate. Some people may think this is literally a camel, a camel to go through the eye of a little bitty needle. 
a little needle that's sewn. As a matter of fact, in Luke's account, the word needle is a surgeon's needle. In Matthew and Mark, the word needle is a uh, the, the sewing needle that's used by various people. What that means is, well, I'll really say that, this shows it's not something something out of the ordinary that we don't know about, but this shows it's literally that, that little needle. Uh, imagine that little needle. How hard it is to get thread through that little needle? And he says a camel has to go through that. The idea is it's very hard. Now, it's not impossible because that's what he's going to say next. Uh, with man, it's impossible. With God, it's not. And then you notice, uh, he says that's how hard it is for rich men to enter the kingdom of God because that rich man is going to let the riches dwell his life, going to let his riches guide his life. Verse 26, they were exceedingly astonished because they'd heard their whole life. If you're rich, if you're wealthy, then that means God is for you. That means you're being the man God wants you to be. And now Jesus says, no, that, that's not the case. It's harder for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. It's harder for a rich man to be a, be a Christian, if you will, than a poor man. Why? Because that rich man let his possessions guide him. That rich man let his possessions uh, hinder him. And so they asked then, who can be saved? If the, the rich man is going to have a hard time, about the poor man? Because a poor man is not blessed by God. The poor man is not doing what God wants to do. Is there no hope for the rest of us? And Jesus looked at him and he says, well, man, it is impossible. With man, it's not possible to be saved, but with, not with God. For all things are possible with God. You see, Jesus is saying it's not about your wealth. It's not about this earthly life, but it's about how you live. It's about how you serve, about how faithful and true you are. And then G, Peter speaks, and Peter asks a very blunt question. Peter says, we've left everything to follow you. What about us? What shall we get? And Jesus tells him, I know what you've left, Peter. I know what you've given up, and I know what the people in the future will give up. He said, those who've left family, those who've left the house, those who've left lands, those who've left money for my sake and the gospel's sake. He said, I know what you've done. And he says, therefore, he says, I know what you've done. He says, you'll receive a reward. Now, notice this reward. He said, you'll receive, and he says, who, who will not receive a hundredfold uh, now in this time uh, with all those things, and then notice, and in the end, in the age to come, eternal life. He says, one, he says, you're going to be rewarded in this life. He says, you're going to be rewarded with replacements for what you give up. He's not going to literally give them 100 houses. Uh, that's not what Jesus is saying. He says, you're going to get something that's much more valuable. And it's very interesting. This is something that I've come to learn, and I can say this as a preacher, and the, the common church member knows this too, uh, to an extent, but uh, as a preacher, I know this even more. And that is, you look at what we've done, and, and I'm not trying to say anything bragging or anything like that, that. There's all kind of preachers you can talk to, all the ones around here who have done this. Many preachers will leave their home, will leave where they grew up. I grew up hours from here, uh, two hours in, in Florence. I've left that, and I've went different places to preach. I've left family. I've left friends. I've left what I, my hometown. But God has blessed me even more so. Because instead of just having the one hometown I grew up in, I've had two or three that I've lived in that, that are dear to me, and, and Fulton is just as dear as those. I've been blessed. I, I, I've seen this fulfillment because I've been blessed because I've been blessed with many spiritual fathers and mothers, many who are there in my home congregation, many who I've found since then, and, and even in this congregation. I found brothers and sisters and children in these home congregations, uh, people that I have been able to take in as my own. You see, what Jesus lays out is that we are we become a part of a spiritual family, a spiritual family that will bless you so much more than a physical can. Now, let's not say physicals are bad, because physical is good, but there's more to it, too. And you see, that's something you can look forward to. That's some of the great things about the church, is when you get into the community of the church, you'll find a blessing. You'll find a blessing. Uh, again, as a preacher, something I see, uh, it amazes me to go to a funeral of a, of a person who's not a member of the church versus a person who he is. Because you go to a person who's not a member of the church and his family's not a member of the church, there's not as many people who come out. But when you go to a person who's a part of the church, you'll see a lot of church people come through. A lot of their spiritual family will come through and say, we're sorry for your loss. We, we, we know this is sad. And, and again, this is probably something I've not experienced yet, uh, but it's you will see. And that's one of the blessings of the church. As Jesus said, whatever you give, give up in this life, number one, God knows what it is. And Jesus knows what it is. But number two, you'll receive even greater blessing. God knows what you give up, and God will bless you even more. And then, that's just in this life. And he says in the life to come, he says you'll have eternal life. You'll have the very thing you want. You'll have the very thing you desire. And then verse 31, but many who are first 
will be last and the last first. Those who are first in this world, those who are rich, those who are powerful, those who have the things in this life, he said in life to come, they'll be last. Why? Because they've held on to their earthly things. They've held on to their things of this world and not served God as he would have them do. But the last, those who are poor, those who are lacking, those who don't have what they need, those who don't have all the things that God has promised them, they will be the first. They will be the blessed in the kingdom of God. They will be the ones who are faithful. They'll be the ones that God looks after and God cares for. We're going to stop right there tonight in our study of Mark chapter 10. Next week, we'll pick up here in verse 32, and we'll finish the rest of this chapter. I uh, appreciate you joining us again. I'm sorry we're not able to do this live. Uh, next week, our plan is to be back live, as we, all, as we always do. Uh, but until then, we hope you're, uh, you're doing good. I hope you're having a good time at school. I hope it's not too hard. And again, uh, we will get with you shortly. We've we got some things we're wanting to do. Uh, so we'll let you know about those, uh, hopefully, in the coming days, this coming up week. Uh, but until next time, again, we hope that you're having good days, having good times. I uh, hope to see you all Sunday morning. Uh, but until we see you again, uh, we'll talk to you later.